All right, guys, welcome back. It's me, Daniel, with Vintage Magic. Taka! All right, guys, happy Friday. Hope you guys had a great week. Uh, this video is all about asset distribution. It's kind of a, mm, a detailed subject, so if you got some free time, make sure uh, you watch the video a few, uh, you know, a bunch of times because it has a little bit of complexity to it. Also, for those of you going to Orlando to meet with us, we're gonna post uh, the event link below. Uh, cool stuff games in the South Orlando location. Uh, Open Boosters, Edwin the Magic Engineer, Tavis the uh, Magic Historian. We're all gonna be there playing some games. Hope to see you guys. Uh, it's not sponsoring Cool Stuff Inc. It's just they've been kind of us to allow us to come film, hang out, do a little uh, fun activities, old school stuff. Also, I'll bring like the original alpha artwork for like Time Walk, Mock Sapphire, Underground Sea. I think I'll bring Clone. Um, if you like old school magic art, take some pictures with it. Uh, the Mock Sapphire is sold to another buyer, so uh, it's probably the last chance you'll see it for a long, long time. Uh, make sure you bring your old school magic decks uh, or uh, you have other cool magic artifacts. You can bring them. That'd be awesome. And so, yeah, we look forward to meeting you guys. Friday, February 22nd, uh, Cool Stuff Games. All right. Um, as far as asset distribution. Okay, so uh, I first want to give props to my friend Will in Vancouver, Canada. We were talking more about kind of magic finance as a whole, kind of where it's at as an investment, yada, yada, yada. <sighs> Got to recharge, guys. Got to recharge. And we'll, um, we'll basically, I got, you know, sponsorship with Diet Coke. One, one of these days, Diet Coke is going to put my name or Vintage Magic or some something on these cans. I wish they would just customize them for people. I think they do probably. All right. So asset, ask it, asset allocation or asset distribution, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's basically the, the economic principle of, uh, distributing your assets that you have in a way where it's balanced and also, uh, you know, really we just want the most ROI, return on investment. And generally what the, happens is people tend to go overweight or underweight on certain categories and it's and they shift it quite a bit. Overweight and underweight, you can look them up. They're basically financial terms of having too much or too little in a certain asset class. And Magic the Gathering, in some ways, is considered an asset class. It's under the non-registered assets, commodity, uh, you know, kind of feel-good art collectible category. Whatever you want to play it, it's another type of asset that is part of, uh, you, know, you know, wealth building. Uh, so as this is a Financial Friday, I thought this was a good subject because... As we're shifting, I, you know, I want to. One thing I sparked with the conversation Will and I was back in the day, a hundred thousand dollars of cash and a hundred thousand dollar collection used to be pretty a wealthy collection, a pretty sizable collection. Uh, Two hundred, five hundred thousand dollar collection is insane, right? Even a million dollars would be insanely large for a Magic the Gathering collection. You know, for example, like a Beta Star Deck box, I used to buy those for $25,000. And they're probably worth, I don't know, $250,000. Who knows, right? Depending on who's willing to buy it. So the prices of Magic Collectibles has gone a totally different spectrum, right? It doesn't matter if it's Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh! Magic has risen as a superstar, the superstar of the gaming industry. So keep in mind, you know, the dollar values that we're using it's very important to understand that, you know, it's all relative. You can't just be like, well, it used to be this price. It used to be a beta starter deck box was 25K. So one day it's going to go back to 25K. So I don't want to buy anything. That's not how it works now. Uh, magic uh, and real estate also is similar where once the price of a home or magic cards go to a certain level of price, it doesn't retrace to the older prices back in the early, early, early days. Sure, there might be corrections and other type of things, but in the case of just like, you know, the normal like 
20 or 30 or 40 percent range, right? It, it, it does not correct to like to the all the way to the bottom. Like, you know, let's say a home was back in the 50s, $30,000, and now it's like $400,000 now. Um, it, it, homes don't go back to $30,000 ever. That's not how it's going to be. There's too much money, too many investors that will buy the homes. Same as magic. It's the same idea. Now, I always get asked the question, how do you get balance your portfolio to make the most money? That's always the ongoing question is how do you, what's the best way to have you know, a certain amount of magic cards or boxes or sealed packs or graded cards or artist proofs or art, you know, some random art there. I, you know, yes, for those of you who figured it out, I put the random Stone Rain original alpha art up there and then there's some graded cards on my keychain holder. I mean, I do that because I want you guys to understand that this type of collectible is all over the place, literally all over the place. And it literally can be a mess if you don't organize your collection, your investment. Um, I find that the number one tip I have for investing correctly in magic is balancing your portfolio <clears throat> in a way in relationship to your principal cash flow. Let me explain that. Number one, if you want to actually have a balanced portfolio, you need to look at how much do I make? And this is also, by the way, assuming your personal life is in order. You're not in debt. You have six months uh, you know, cash for uh, emergency fund, all that, all that kind of stuff. Let's assume you're out of debt, all that kind of stuff. It's all about magic investing. So I would say that if you have to look at balancing your portfolio, it has to be, first off, what is your salary at your job or your investments combined? How much actual money can you spend on magic or investing in general? So let's assume that you can spend $5,000 a month and that's all the other stuff is paid off and all that. Great. And that's $5,000 investing. So what are you going to do? Are you going to put money in the Roth IRA? Are you going to buy maybe some real estate property, save up a down payment? Those are all under consideration. So if you, people always ask me, well, if, what do I do here? Do I just go all in on magic? Do I go all in on ultimate masters? No, do not go all in on ultimate masters. Do not ever, ever, ever do not go all in on a new product. The reason why is it's highly reprintable anytime, any place. If, if, if Wizards wants to just hit the, uh, ignition button to print more on the printing press to have more printed out as a, as a restock or whatever, you have absolutely zero control. Lucky, luckily for the reserve list investors, it, it allows us to have some stability that way. It's like the Fed basically held the rates at a certain point. And you kind of know this for a period of time infinitely, right? That would be incredible information. So, Always stick with things that are more protected through like the reserve list or more ultra rare exclusive items where there's not a lot of uh, external factors like Wizards of the Coast. All right. So one thing I will tell you is that um, in order to balance the portfolio wisely, I have, I have to say that if you have like $5,000 and let's say you decide, okay, I want to put the 5K into Magic the Gathering, not real estate, other investments. Fine. Whatever that number it is, you decide. Maybe you want to put 1,000 to real estate and then the 4,000 to Magic. You got to figure out the number per month. You also have to decide, do I have working cash or capital that I want to invest? So the other part is that you got to be like, and this has to be, you know, healthy amount. It cannot be like, I got 100 bucks. Well, you're not going to go very far. You know, you have to say, hey, I'm willing to allocate X principal to start this investment and I have X to start out. So I typically think that if you are in a range where you can basically buy reserve list cards, I think this conversation, Will and I were talking about it, in order to be, let's say, what I call, let's start at the very top, like market mover. I would say someone that has the ability to buy massive collections, massive amount of art, uh, you know, other box seal boxes and really move a market and grow and, and, and have large, large deals come to your way. You need to have about five to $10 million US dollars to start out. Uh, this doesn't mean just buying a bunch of inventory. 
but it's having the cash flow to buy something and to be able to buy and sell and have short-term and long-term investments. The thing is, most people don't ever have five to ten million dollars. So, but I want to share with you guys that's like the ultimate top end. Obviously, you could have more than that and move the market differently too. But I would say if you're starting out as like a major vintage old school dealer, high end, that's a market mover. Some of you might ask me, well, Dan, what if I have all that in ca uh, cards but not cash? Uh, answer to that is that's I'm talking about cash. See, the problem here is that most people in Magic have a lot of cards and a lot of boxes and stuff. They don't have a lot of cash and they can't really be liquid fast enough or to buy deals fast enough. Also, when you're doing a lot of bigger deals, a lot of people just don't want cards. They just want cash. And if you're the type of person that just has a lot of cards, you got to sell things quickly, you're losing margin somewhere, right? You need to have enough cash to back it up to buy deals. So I'm talking about five to $10 million in cash. Uh, now, you might have some product that might align with it. You might say, well, Dan, I have five to $10 million with cash and cards, so I qualify for that. Uh, whatever. You know, I mean, I would say you're a little bit under that because of the fact that your cash flow does matter. Let's say we talk about the next tier, I'd probably say about a million dollars in cash, a free flowing cash. You have a lot of options also. I wouldn't say you're the, the strongest market mover, but you have a lot of options to buy what you want, uh, large deals, whatnot. Next category I would say is the people in the $500,000 category, $500,000 to a million. And you know, you know that has uh, a situation where you can buy some like old, old cards, like alpha cards, uh, you can buy some seal product, but the problem is you're sometimes stuck with that product for a very long time and you need to find a way to have short-term cash flow also. It's kind of a balance on that way. Um, and then you also have the, the next tier, 500 to what I call 100K, and then I would say 100K to and below is kind of where I'll leave it at. Um, if you're at the tier of like 25K or less, I wouldn't even enter old school, old, older reserveless cards um, until you get to that point. Um, I've gotten to a point where I realized that if you only, let's say, have 5 to 10K, you basically don't, you miss out on a lot of the deals that are out there because the prices of the cards are so expensive and the collections are so expensive. Another thing is you, you don't have enough cash flow to really have any short-term ability. If you buy something, you almost have to always sell it instantly every single time in order to get the cash flow to buy the next deal. So, if you uh, and in old school cards and reserve list cards stuff like that, you generally um, cannot be you know it, it's not super liquid. It's not like uh, the modern cards where you can do buy list quickly, flip it, make a small margin, move on by the next one, and repeat the cycle. So it really depends. Um, I really feel like twenty five k is a magic number to kind of begin. Uh, bigger old school, you know, your journey. I definitely say 100K is a guaranteed, like, that is more of like a stronger principle, if that makes sense. I also, you know, interesting enough, uh, talking to Will, it reminds me of a conversation. I actually had a consultation with a guy who was uh, uh, in Vegas area who wanted to possibly start a magic business. A retired guy wanted to do that. We were thinking about doing a video and it didn't pan out. He had about, I'd probably say about 25K, you know, principal to start out um, and another one to two K or so uh, every month. Uh, that's definitely in the early, you know, the like I said, the beginning, uh, early parts of the investing uh, to make any kind of impact. The thing is, though, you know, what I think he realized was this is the second part of my advice is. In order to buy something and do all this stuff, there's quite a bit of learning you have to have. So the second thing is not just the money. You also have to have the experience before you have any asset allocation. Let me explain that. So a guy like Will, you know, he, in Canada, he's very experienced, been doing this for a long time, has a lot of market research, uh, talked to a lot of different network of people, um, has had good deals and bad deals, understands the differences between uh, re the reserve list and also things that um, are, you know, just things to stay away from, Different uh, understands counterfeits and also fakes, understands the difference between trimmed or altered cards, color cards, ink cards, whatever, right? Fake cards. So 
You have all this experience and knowledge when you buy a collection. And the reason why I think that is one of the biggest things that people always forget, uh, always don't do enough of, is they assume that they can just buy some magic cards and they're just going to be real or they're going to be the condition that it says on eBay. For example, they might say, oh, $100,000 collection on eBay, $20,000, mint condition, black lotus, mock sapphire, blah, 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 blah. You're like, whoa, buy it now. I got to buy this. I got to buy this. I got to buy this. No one's bought it. I have to buy it. It's been on here. You know, I don't know how long it's been on here. I, I have no idea. I've done no research. I don't care. I just want to buy it because it, it's a black lotus. I'm going to make my money in times 100. See, the problem here is, and obviously that's a very extreme Timmy example, you have to understand that you have to do massive amount of research before you buy anything. One of the things that um, I, I see is eBay scams or Craigslist scams. And people send me stuff all the time and you know, or cars that are counterfeit or whatnot. I go, first thing I say to them, very nicely, I said, have you researched what a real card is? Do you understand what a reback card is? Here's some uh, links to my videos, right? But the thing is, people don't take the time to spend any time on their business and themselves. Ask, them, ask yourselves, and the reason why I say this, ask yourselves, when you buy real estate, or let's say you're becoming a doctor, or you're doing an engineer, or you're making airplanes, do you have to learn and do research, study, um, you know, textbooks, take tests, MCATs, whatever, right? You have to pass certain levels of steps, you know, of education to get to a certain point. Unfortunately, Magic doesn't really have an MBA program. It's not like that. In order to grow and, and understand, the preliminary steps are really important is to understand the cards, right? Understand what's fake and not. Those are huge steps. All right, so assuming that you've done all that research, you know all this kind of stuff about things, now let's talk about asset distribution. Let's say you're now able to identify collections. You're able to identify artwork, sketches, things like that, whatever, right? You're able to establish things. Next thing you need to have is a network. No, it's not internet connection. We're talking a network of people. It's really important to understand that in order to decide what to allocate, what assets where, you have to actually have people that you can connect with at all times. Doesn't matter if it's art, artist proofs, cards, ungraded cards, signed cards, art, whatever. Doesn't matter what it is, right? You need to have people in every network that will teach you, uh, go off ideas. Now, do you want to be a brat and just drain, manage drain all their ideas and suck it away and never give anything back? No, you want to be a contributor. It could be on a Facebook forum, whatever. Now, you might have seen on a Facebook forums that people ask questions and they have all these thoughts and it happens almost daily, right? every day, like every second, just about. People ask, hey, you know what? Hey, what do you think this card's fake? Hey, do you think this is a good deal? Hey, do you think this card's clipped? Hey, do you think this seller's crazy? Whatever, right? It happens all the time. <laughs> Jesus. I have to tell you that your fourth thing is time. Before you contribute any of your time, any of all this, Determine your time value of money. Understand that your time is very valuable in terms of searching for cards, searching for the assets, right? Buying collections, meeting people to buy it, go to the bank, pay it, right? Flying out there, in my case, all the freaking time, all over the world. It takes a lot of time. It drains from your, your, your health. It takes away time from your family. It's a work-life balance. It's extremely difficult. So you have to understand, there's a lot of factors and time plays into it too. And lastly, before you even get into asset allocation, this is probably the number one thing. Number one thing that I see is a flaw that no one ever, ever, ever thinks about. Paying too little or paying too much. Yeah, I said it. Some people out there just never, ever want to pay more. I get it. I get it. I get it. I want to pay 25% lower every single time. In Rudy's case, when I've met him before, he would want to pay, he didn't want to pay the PayPal fee. It ruined the deals. He didn't want to buy it. He didn't want to pay the 3%. So 
you lost out on tons of alpha cards, right? So you have a situation where if you don't pony up extra money, right, sometimes in a deal that the seller wants, you're going to lose the deal entirely. Obviously, in deals that are super tight, super close, right, it's not necessarily even the best deal anyway. If you're fighting to get a percentage point here and there, ask yourself the bigger picture. Is this deal really something I can even sell and make money long term because I'm fighting just for a few percentage points? That's the problem is that most people are literally on the brink of, you know, I, I think this margins are too close. So remember, paying too little sometimes in cards that it will go up exponentially. For example, if there's a mint alpha lotus right in front of your face right now, ask yourself. The buy list, look it up on Star Cities, like 14, 15K, whatever, ABU Games, and the guy wants $30,000. You're like, what? $30,000? Are you freaking crazy? That's double buy list. Are you, are you nuts? Okay. You go on eBay. Well, you say, whoa, BGS9, Alpha Lotus, they've been sold for $55,000. Wait a second. So if it got a BGS9, I could make probably 25K, maybe 20K, whatever. Bought it for 30K. Do I offer 25K to maybe get closer? Or do I just run away because it's not a buy list? A lot of people run away. Most people will run away because the seller, let's say, wants, okay, fine. I want 30K, I'll negotiate 25K. Ungraded Minty Alpha Lotus. You need to understand all the five things I just said, the research, the uh, understanding if it's uh, not altered, all those things, right? You need to understand that all those things combined are at that moment in time. Is that Alpha Lotus going to grade me a 9 or 9.5? Obviously, if it grades a 9.5, I'd make 100K, uh, you know, sale plus, you know, whatever. It, it could... Be amazing, right? Or let's say it gets a nine. Let's say it gets an eight five. Do I break even at an eight five? Do I break even at an eight? You have to understand the worst case scenario. So this is a, a good scenario case of buying. Should I buy higher? If for me and a quality high end Alpha Lotus came by and it was ungraded, not graded, and it was you know the guy wanted thirty k, I would actually pay thirty k. If it was centered, it was clean, no, you know, obviously no other issues, counterfeit issues, um, I would take the risk, right? The, the, the investment. Now, you're probably saying, well, Dan, I only got 25K. I only have 30K. Should I just buy one card, one card, and just go all in on that one card? To answer your question, yes. In some cases, if the good deal is so good or the, the, the risk and reward is so good, the spread, you have nothing to lose, really, then you should do it. Now, the problem is most people want, this is a, one of those weird caveats of, of what weird quirks of asset allocation, is they want quantity in their asset, the asset distribution versus quality. Quantity versus quality. Ongoing battle of the history of time in business. Should I have the shittier BGS, un-BGS, unplayed, uh, you know, beat the crap Alpha 40 cards just because I like them? No offense to Alpha 40, but let's say I have a ton of those or Arabian Nights beat up and play. I just want tons of played cards for the players. It's all for the players. Or do I want to go for the extreme and get that one Alpha 9-5 Alpha Lotus? And that's all I can buy. That's all I want. I'm going to hold one stock. Do I want one big time stock? One share of Berkshire Hathaway? Or do I want tens of thousands of shares of some idiot stock? I don't know. Some $1 stock. What would you do, right? The reality is, it doesn't matter if your entry price on the one card or all the small things are smaller. It matters more about what's the potential return on that investment. What's the ROI on that collection? So it has nothing to do with buy the big card or the small stuff, right? So in the case, what I just said, 
I would pay higher than buy list. So I can basically potentially make more profit with that one card. Now, you're probably saying, huh, what if I just buy a bunch of revised dual ends or all this other stuff? I have some big cards, small cards, medium cards, whatever. Is that a potentially good, better investment? I got to tell you, sometimes not. Because your time, work. Think about that factor. The amount of time it takes to sell lots of little revised dual lands, lots of little reserveless cards, antiquities cards, legends cards, whatever, right? And organize them, sort them, mess around, find buyers, PayPal, whatever, right? Shipping versus one card, Alpha Black Lotus, graded to Beckett, PSA, PSA, graded to them, whatever. And that card gets a nine or a nine five or a PSA 10. That time is so little. And then when you find the buyer, you're gonna get paid incredible amounts of cash and then your principal increases and then the next thing to do after all this asset allocation exists you basically then reinvest how do i then buy more assets and allocate that money into making more capital once you start a system of building more capital grading cards buying collections selling cards short-term long-term getting nice grades, getting shittier grades, you got to crack open and basically uh, they're misgraded. You got to like regrade because that's the way it goes. Or maybe you have to sell some cards to some players because uh, some cards spiked up too high. You have too many of these. Do you see where I'm going with this? Maybe I have too many modern cards because of the fact that I bought a collection with modern cards and I got to get rid of those modern cards because I just have to make it increase the capital for other cards. You have to be able to understand which asset do you shift to get the better ROI? Sometimes you pay more, then let's talk about paying less. Last thing, paying less. The trick to paying less is understanding the body language of the individual or the talking language of the person. One thing I realize is that when you deal with like a trader on the floor or like a buyer at a, at a, a shop uh, at, a, at a GP, most of these people are going to be hard line at a certain price. You can ask them the question, what's your bottom line? People that are more desperate and stuff like that, they don't even know what their bottom line is. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? People that are, you know, they need, you know, a car, uh, they need a house, they don't care, they got it back in 93, whatever, right? People don't really know the bottom line, these kind of people. So you're able to, so you can either pay buy list and pay, you know, what it is and make some a percentage, or you can even start to negotiate at a lower price point. Well, halt the brakes. People will be like, well, Dan, that's a ripoff to them. No, it's not. Because the, the seller of the cards needs to understand what they have. They need to understand what they have, how it's going to go, and what they, you know, what, what they're asking is their choice. Uh, happens quite a bit, actually. Common thing you ask is, hey, you know, and I, I'm buying a, co a collection from a person. Hey, how much would you like? Uh, I don't really know. I got these back in 93, 94, whatever, and, you know, I've been sitting around my closet. I go, okay, how about I offer you $100,000? Back of your mind, collection's worth $300,000. You're like, you're like thinking, wait a second, if I buy, bought buy list type of cards, I would have had to pay maybe $200,000, right? Because it's a 33% margin instead. Or... I don't know if the math's right. The math's right on that, but it's. You see where I'm going with this? It. You're. You're 50 percent margin. You're basically, basically, uh, uh, making an offer in the dark, trying to use a large amount of money to basically make a deal occur. Um, it's not untruthful, nor is it wrong, because here's what happens: the seller A needs to do the research. They can easily say no. That's too low. That's fine. The other thing is, you're just using amount of money and you're trying to get X amount of margin without doing a lot of work. See, in large collections, you don't want to sit there. I mean, you don't want to sit there and with your calc graphing, graphic TI-85 calculator and calculate all of the tens of thousands of loose cards in the world out there. Nor do you want to sit on a buy list. Uh, you know, with st you know you're, not a, you're not a buyer like that. Do you have the time to do this? Absolutely freaking not. You could use the 80-20 rule where 80% of the value is in 20% of the cards. But the thing is, you know, sometimes making a blanket big cash offer looks really good. 
the guy might come back to you and say, hey, you know what, 100K, that sounds pretty good, but how about, you know, I want 125K. You're like, wow, this is $300,000 of sales probably. 125K? Sure. Do you at that point negotiate the 25K or do you, to get to 100K where you want, break in the middle, you have a little room there, but body language, you got to recognize, hey, is this kind of where it's at? Reason why I say this is that sometimes if you are too aggressive with getting too low of the price, the buyer can actually walk away even though you had that glimmer of opportunity to buy that deal at that moment in time. And if you overthink those things, you actually end up losing the deal in some ways. So that's another thing I've noticed over the years of understanding buyers' you know, perception of where they are in their life and also you know, leveraging large amounts of money. You have to be able to uh, leverage things um, and know the body language in the, in the negotiation. Um, it's important to recognize that if you're a weak salesperson, if you're not someone who is a people person, someone that is willing to negotiate, not an asshole, right? And everybody, you know, everybody in sales thinks that they're a great salesperson. They think they're an amazing salesperson. The thing is, I'm, I think I'm a decent salesperson, but I'm always learning to be a better salesperson. I'm always trying to try to grow as uh, an individual. If you're not humble enough to say, hey, look, I, I'm not good at this technique. Maybe my communication here was not good. My follow-up wasn't the best. Whatever, right? Then you need to understand that that will help you grow in all of the abilities of asset distribution allocation. It'll allow you to negotiate better deals, and it will allow you to eventually uh, get a higher return on your investment overall. All right, guys, I hope to see you guys in Orlando, by the way, if you're there. If you're not, that's okay. We'll have a lot of cool videos. I look forward to seeing my friend Edwin, Open Boosters, and Tavis. Uh, if you guys are around, say hi uh, and look for some more videos. We'll talk to you guys soon. Take care. Have a great weekend.